Hello. This is real hold on to your hat country, because I'm standing at Berghead, a small fishing harbour, on the northernmost tip of a promontory, a bit of land that sticks out into the Murray Firth in the northeast area of Scotland. Now, this promontory divides two bays. To the east is Spey Bay, to the west is Berghead Bay, and beyond it, the bar of Culbin Sands and Culbin Forest. This area is really fascinating because it demonstrates just what effect a combination of waves, wind and weather can have upon a coastline. 22 kilometers east of Berghead is the mouth of the River Spey. This river mouth is a useful place to begin our examination of the Moray Coast, since here we can see the material brought down by a powerful river. And at the river mouth, we can see the work of the two major agencies, the river and the sea, working together to produce coastal features which recur along this coast, ending in the massive features found at Culbin Sands. The Spey is one of the largest Scottish rivers. From its source near the head of Glenroy to the river mouth in Spey Bay is a distance of 140 kilometers. This is the river which flows through the glaciated valley in which Aviemore is situated. Leaving the mountainous area, the river crosses the lowlands of Morrisha called the Lago Murray. This lowland, although based on old red sandstone rocks, is overlain with thick and extensive layers of sands and gravels brought here and deposited by massive glaciers. To these deposits have been added the deposits of the river. Particularly in the spring, the streams are swollen with flood water after the snows have melted and rainfall is heavy on the mountains. It's at this time that the river is carrying its heaviest load. The results are seen clearly here at the river mouth. The Spey approaches the sea through numerous channels divided by beds of river deposits. Sands, gravels, pebbles and boulders are all mixed together to form the deposited load. At the coast, the mouth of the Spey is seen to be diverted westwards by a narrow shingle spit which has been built up by the sea, working upon deposits of river origin and upon materials derived from the seafloor and from deposits further east. Over the last 200 years, several attempts have been made to control the growth of this spit Originally, this was to let boats enter the river mouth. More recently, it's been to enable the easy discharge of flood water from the Spey. The rivers, like the Spey, crossing the Lago Moray, are clearly an important source of material for coastal features. The cliffs form another source of material as they're being eroded continuously by the sea. Some 15 kilometers west of the Spey mouth, the erosive work of the sea can be seen clearly in the cliffs and caves of the coast surrounding Sculptor's Cave. The old red sandstone here has a distinctive stratification. Notice the horizontal bedding, and the rock is being eroded at the base of the almost vertical cliffs. By processes of hydraulic action, that's when the sea acts as a mighty battering ram, corrasion, when the sea, armed with the broken fragments, wears away the cliff face, and corrosion, when the sea erodes the rock by chemical action, the cliff face retreats landwards while the sea transports the material and deposits it elsewhere along the coast. To see the full impact of the transportation process, which is followed in turn by deposition, we need to look further west to where the tides and winds have carried the materials. A further six kilometers along the Moray coast, the peninsula of Berghead is a distinctive landmark. Here we see the town built on a rectangular grid pattern laid out along the length of the peninsula. On the more sheltered western side is the harbor with fishing boats at anchor. On the more exposed eastern side stands the massive building of the malt distillery, which provides an essential raw material, the malt, for the numerous distilleries in this region, especially in the lower Spey Valley. 
There are more whisky distilleries concentrated there than in any other part of Scotland. Burghead is at the eastern end of the great sweeping crescent of Burghead Bay, which finishes on the western end at the hooked spit marking the mouth of the river Findhorn. This spit, similar to the one at Speymouth, is a prelude to the superb coastal features found along the coast, starting on the other bank of the river. Sailing westward from Findhorn, our first impression of the coast is just of a long, sandy strip. On this detailed map of the area, however, we can see that the line of sand which we saw from the boat is not the main coastline at all, but an offshore bar approximately five kilometers long overall and at most 300 meters wide. From the sea, it didn't look very impressive. But from the air, it takes on a new dimension. Here we begin to appreciate the size of the feature. The seaward side of the bar, at the bottom there, appears to be straight and smooth. But on the inland side, there are almost parallel recurved hooks. Now let's have a look at the main processes which have brought this about. The bar has been formed by longshore drift. Although the prevailing winds over Scotland as a whole are westerly, the local prevailing winds are from the north and east. The result is the creation of waves which move loose material along the shore. At the westward end, the waves turn to produce the hooked features. Each period of growth produces new hooks. Inside the hooks, material gathers, eventually widening the bar and helping to fill the area between the bar and the shore. This process is continuous. The bar is composed mainly of sand and shingle with some small pebbles. In this, it resembles the spits we saw at the mouths of the Spey and the Findhorn. These materials, some of which are glacial in origin, come pouring into the Moray Firth from the rivers, from sea erosion on the cliffs, and from the outpourings of ancient valley glaciers. Running along the length of the bar are parallel ridges made up of shingle. The northern or seaward side of the bar is being eroded and there's historical evidence to show that the bar is growing westward and also extending landwards. On this 18th century map, we see the coastline as it then was. Now we see how far the sandbar had extended by 1974. Let's look at the change again. At low tide, between the bar and the mainland, are extensive saltings in an area being filled in by coastal deposits. This is a good example of the way in which the sea enlarges the land surface, a contrast with its demolition work we saw earlier in Sculptor's Cave. The shore itself shows other features of coastal deposition. Across the saltings, we can see a wooded shoreline. From the sea, it's difficult to judge how high the trees are or how far the woodlands extend inland. But in fact, these dunes, rising steeply out of the sea, are the northern limit of one of the most extensive afforested coastal dune lands in Britain. This is part of the 2,428 hectares of the Culbin Sands. Coniferous trees have been planted here since the Forestry Commission started to take over the area in 1921. The forest is divided by wind breaks and forestry roads. From this height, the dunes are only slightly suggested. At ground level, however, we can see the more detailed features of the forest. They tell me it contains about five and a half million trees, although I don't know who's counted them. And that means that there's one for every inhabitant of Scotland with quite a few left over. The area first became planted with trees when sand from the shore was blown in by the onshore winds and it started overwhelming the land that existed here before. It built up into tremendous sand dunes. The highest dune is about 35 meters in height. The one that I'm standing on now is about 22, 23 meters high. 
and all these trees were planted to stop the dunes moving inland. Well, they didn't stop it very effectively because several settlements were completely overwhelmed and disappeared. But the result is now one of the largest tracts of forest in this country operated by the Forestry Commission. The dunes have a distinctive shape, steeper on the lee side than on the gently sloping windward side. We can see these slopes now, strewn with needles from the Scots pines, Corsican pines and large pole pines which cover the area. At the start of a new scene in some of the plays of William Shakespeare, you'll often read the stage instruction in another part of the forest. Well, I'm now in another part of the forest, another part of the Culbin forest in the northeast corner. And I'm here because of something very interesting which proves what I was saying earlier about the way the sand dunes moved inland and covered the land that had been there before. Where we are now, about 300 years ago, the estate owner, a man called Alexander Kinnaird, had to ask the Crown to excuse him of his debts because the sand dunes had moved in and had made the estate that he was farming absolutely worthless. Well, pine trees were planted in an attempt to stop the dunes coming in. The prevailing wind blowing along here blew away most of the sand that existed. The sand dunes are still here. The pine trees have fixed them. They no longer move. But if you want to know what was here when Alexander Kinnaird was in financial trouble, all you have to do is scrape away the top, and there underneath is the rich soil that he was farming nearly 300 years ago before the sand dunes covered it. A pit cut into the forest soil reveals the layers into which the tree roots penetrate. At the surface is a thin layer of needles and decaying vegetation. Next comes another thin layer of soil produced from the humus. And then there's sand, which begins within six centimeters of the surface. This sequence of layers is described as a soil profile. The forests have two quite distinct purposes. The obvious one is to grow trees which can be cut and sold for timber. The other is to retain the dunes and make use of land which would otherwise be commercially useless. Some environmentalists, however, see drawbacks and argue that such forests discourage wildlife in the form of birds and small mammals and plants. Indeed, the density of the coniferous trees does reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the ground, and this doesn't permit a rich growth of vegetation on the forest floor. The sort of plants which do grow include mosses, lichens, and ferns. The trees do provide a home for the red squirrel, a small mammal which has been driven away from many woodlands by the grey squirrel. The edges of the forest certainly do attract bird life, like the heron. A notable rarity is the osprey, or sea eagle. We were lucky to film this osprey from the eastern edge of the forest near the small fishing village of Findhorn. Like the overwhelmed estate in the Culbin Forest, Findhorn too has been influenced by the sand deposits. Findhorn is now situated on the eastern bank of Findhorn Bay, but historical evidence shows that the village was previously located on the other side of the bay. Movement in the course of the river Findhorn, resulting from large deposits of sand, destroyed the former site. In fact, 
The site of Findhorn has changed at least twice and possibly three times in the last 400 years due to the deposits of sand. Inland from the Culbin Sands spreads the flat, rich agricultural land of the Lega Mori. Traditionally, much of this land has belonged to the lairds, rich landowners who have a number of tenant farmers. One example is the estate of the Earl of Cawdor, a descendant of the ancient Thanes of Cawdor. Cawdor Castle, nine and a half kilometers from Nairn, was the scene of Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Our study has taken us along the coast from Spey Bay through Berghead to the Calvin Sands. Running a short distance from the coastline is the Inverness to Aberdeen railway line, which connects Nairn to Forest and then Elgin. These small towns have a distinctive character, like Elgin here. They focus on a main shopping street flanked by stone-built houses. Elgin is also a cathedral city. The now ruined Gothic cathedral is the third largest in Scotland. Elgin is the county town of Morishia and acts as a central point for the needs of surrounding farms and settlements. There are various industries here, such as woolen mills, engineering works, and distilleries. This inland town contrasts with the holiday resort of Nairn. Nairn's shingle and sandy beach leads eastwards to the limits of the Culbin forest and to the Culbin bar two kilometers away. Our study of the build-up of the Culbin dunes on the bar has shown a general movement of the deposits westward. For the distant future, it's worth imagining what this trend could mean for the community of Nairn. <laughs> 